penetration. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, you know it. Anyway, he, 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 he told the story in the book, it happened in the 70s, he was approached by people from the intelligence community and they wanted him to do remote viewing. That's right. On, on the backside of the moon and he found something. Oh, did he? Yeah, stuff. He, he called it stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then I talked to a friend of mine, he is an esoteric uh, scholar. And he said that, well, the moon, uh, according to esoteric uh, uh, schools, have, has al always had a bad influence on, the, on us. Yeah. And uh, I think that is, uh, that is quite interesting, because in the, in the romantic view of the moon, it's al always something positive. Right. But esoterically, it's, it's a bad influence. Do, how? Can you comment on that? Well, how is it bad, esoterically? I don't really know, but it's, it seems to affect people negatively. I mean, we have the we have these expressions of uh, what's it called, moon crazy. We have yeah. in the asylums, everybody knows that when there is a full moon, yes. more people are worried or and crazy. Right. And you can see there are more strange crimes going on. So if you look at the statistics, it seems to be true. But what is it all about? I don't know. Well, if you stay around a little while this evening, we, you might see us get very crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the moon is coming up. The, did the Gnostic has anything to say about the moon? Who? Who? The Gnostic. Uh, no, but I do have a lot to say about it. And I'm a Gnostic. Yeah. And I would say totally to the contrary. Yeah, me too. Totally. Really? Oh, yeah, me too. Us. Me too. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the opposite yeah, for it me. It really is. Oh, right. mm -hmm. And as far as those, I know what you mean mm -hmm. because I've studied every occult system, you know, in the world that you can access in the English language. Anyway, I know there are some occultists that wrote in German, in Russian, or Italian that you know maybe I haven't reached. But every occultist teacher who wrote in English, I have studied in depth. And I have encountered this uh, thought about the, the negative view of the moon. Yeah. You know? And uh, uh, my view of that is uh, very uh, uh, brutal <laughs> and very simple. Uh, anyone who says that, and they're all men, are in fear of the feminine power of yes. their own psyche. That's all. Oh, really? Yes. It's, it's just a projection of fear. Yes. Because the moon has a particular feminine Ooh, yeah. quality. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. And actually, in this system of planetary tantra, we love the moon, mm -hmm. don't we? Yes, we, we do. We follow the moon intimately through the course of every month, mm -hmm. and we associate the cycles of the moon mm -hmm. uh, with certain female divinities, exclusively female. Aren't there? Yeah. For do instance... You, do you know anything about PT? Planetary Tantra. Planetary Tantra. Planetary Tantra? No, no, I don't. No. 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 Planetary Tantra. Yes, mm. Planetary no. Tantra. I don't know. That is the Gnostic method of today. Mm -hmm. It's Planetary Tantra. So the Gnostics are gone. You know, they, they're they gone. It's an ancient movement. They were... Uh, many of them were destroyed. You know, their works were destroyed, they were persecuted and so forth, so we don't, we're not a Gnostic revival that we're reviving some ancient uh, movement, you know. Gnosticism today is reborn mm. in mm. planetary tantra. Okay. And we love the moon, and so we have the, mm. we, re, we recognize, like I recognize right now, that that moon is the moon of Swan Deva. Mm -hmm. And Swan Deva is one of the names that we use for the f these female powers, mm. you know. Uh, in Planetary Tantra, you learn that the Earth is emanating 16 different frequencies. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you can connect and interact with these frequencies. And everyone in this room does that. And we do it in a variety of ways. The primary way that we interact with our frequencies is we follow 
the cycle of the moon. You see? By doing a, a, a schedule and also observing. Yeah, you have to observe it directly. It doesn't do it in your head. You wait, you watch the crescent moon. You know how sometimes in the evenings you come out of your house and, and it's twilight and then you see that crescent moon in the sky? Mm -hmm. You know, that thin crescent moon? We watch for that. We wait for that. Mm. You know how the moment when you see it, it's always kind of like surprises you. It's like, oh, mm. you know, we welcome that. We welcome that surprise. Because we know that at that moment, we are logging on to a certain frequency. And we know what the frequency is. Mm. And we know how to handle it. We know how to use it. We know how it is working on our minds. So this is one of the methods of planetary time travel. We love the moon, mm -hmm. and we're not afraid of it at all. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, yeah. Because it's a disinformation again. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, you know, no, obviously there is a factual basis in that uh, accidents happen, or uh, mad people who are people who are already crazy get crazier. They get more energy. Yeah, and things like that. Yes. Yeah. But that's simply because at the full moon, like right now, there is a boost of that frequency. And mm. that frequency becomes uh, distributed. Mm. And some people don't know how to handle it, and so they act in a bizarre manner. They drive they also that's not they the fault. Yeah, it's not the I would fault like to say moon. something about that, because I also read uh, this... Mm. Uh, statistics and, and have this have, have um, looked at these kind of things also and I know I know a firefighter for instance and he said the same thing that he goes right out uh, more often when when this happens and okay yeah, he also have heard this this mm -hmm. uh, rumor you could say and uh, I mean I I myself can feel uh, more energy during a full moon mm -hmm. it can be but it's <clears throat> For me, it's uh, I think it's about handling things. Also, I think if you carry a lot of things inside you um, that are unresolved, unresolved yeah. things, That's everything, true. because like you said, I mean, it's it's energy, right, coming in, and if you don't have any direction aimed, because that's also a very key thing in planetary tantra, that your aim. You have the story. You are also very close to nature. You found you find certain key elements You're grounded, in, grounded nature. in nature. Yeah. Mm. But it's also uh, um, um, a way of uh, you know surfing, you could say, right? Yes. And also how good you are in your physical and and, and psychological makeup. You know where you are in your life. I think mm. because many people have problems, and I think it's a little bit the same with uh, uh, certain drugs also. Mm. People are ungrounded. You know, ungrounded ungrounded people that ha have a lot of problems in their in their uh, system. Yeah. We were when we come here. We, we I, see I these. So. Uh, mm, yeah. I see these beautiful point. coves in these places where people are living, and they have their little boats. You know tied there to the wharf, right? They have a little boat and they have a line and the, it, it goes to the wharf so that your boat is tied to the wharf, right? Mm -hmm. And so if the sea gets agitated, your little boat, you know, will get thrown around but it will still be there because it's tied to the wharf or it's tied to an anchor. It's grounded. Mm -hmm. And so, but most people are not grounded. They're not anchored. And so when the when the moon comes on and the moonlight comes, they get agitated mm. and they become more crazy and erratic and yes. they create fires and they create accidents mm. and you know. Yeah, it's log logical. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the fault of the moon. No. It's not the fault of the moon no. right. at all. It's not to blame the moon for right. it. Yeah. Yeah, we're not to blame uh, the other thing. It's an activation of something, I think, more. No. As soon as I, I see the moon, I feel loud. All the time. I would say that the moon more <laughs> heal people than in, and, 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 and uh, yeah. how do you say uh, get the things out of the system, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's more like a, uh, you go, you will go to the edge of things, maybe. Oh yeah. I think it's my feeling of it. Mm. I think so. <laughs>
<laughs> did you did you say uh, uh, where the Jews come from? Where the moon comes from? The Jews. The, the Jews. The Jews tribe. Yeah. Yes, I know where they come from now. Uh, did you say it? No, I didn't say it. Yeah. No. no, I didn't say it. Yeah, I didn't say the word. No, no, there's a word. There are two words. There are two words that you need to know, and they're very strange words. One of them I learned originally from Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. And Rudolf Steiner was the only person that I heard use this word. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Because Steiner, you know, did have some, sometimes he had some intel that, like, was quite striking, you know. So I got part of the description of the Zenosh is from a word okay. and then I learned this other word from this man okay. mm -hmm. and this explains who they are racially and where they come from and no one has been able to do that yet because the Jews don't want anybody to know it's oh you know how it is with them it's like, oh, you know, always hiding always you know the trickster the shapeshifter you know is it a religion? Is it a race? Yes, it's a religion. No, it's not. Yes, it's a race. It's very confusing. Now, what are they? What is a Jew? What is a... And to me, to know what their actual racial strain is, they're actual, uh, actually of the Semitic Arabic peoples, but they are a particular strain of those people. Mm. And I now know what that strain is. And what is it, Anna? I've been sucking it out. It's time. Yeah, I heard you say. Is there, let's hear the, the vibration. Chinese. Okay, well, Rudolf Steiner called them the Turanians. Mm -hmm. The Turan, Turanian. T U R A N I A N. Well, uh, so that was what he called, that was the word that I found in Steiner that refers to these people. That is like the more ancient name of them. They were known as the Turanians. There were the Iranians and there were the Turanians. And Rudolf Steiner is the only person I've ever heard talk about that. So we know that the Iranians are our spiritual forefathers because they produced the, mist, uh, the Gnostic movement, right? The mm -hmm. Iranians mm -hmm. of the area of the world that is between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. My wife is exactly yeah. from Azerbaijan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From what is now mm -hmm. Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. Okay? This was the home of the Iranian peoples and also the home of the Gnostic movement. Oh, fantastic. Right. Why, why did I pick her? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting right, better. Uh, and, yeah. uh, not in this image about the split of the... Of the Magian order. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is this? No, it's not, not the same. Oh. This is much more ancient. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So, there were also, at the same time, and we're talking now, Six, eight thousand years BC. So, we're talking a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. You know, seven, seven thousand years ago, a long time ago. Okay. Uh, there were the Iranians oh. and there were the Turanians. Okay. And the Turanians were like uh, a people that had no higher understanding. And they were uh, warlike and sadistic, and their only interest was in the material world. They did not have an intelligence or interest in the uh, beyond the crude material world. You know, which is true of Jews. You know, they don't. That's why they money is everything to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were sadistic, materialistic wanting to conquer and dominate other people, and very clever and very devious liars and deceivers. This is the profile of this, this Turanian race. And they were brutal. Mm -hmm. They had no mercy and no compassion. Okay? So they come from... They come strain. from what is now Turkmenistan. 
From the area of Turkmenistan. Is it? It Turkey? borders on Iran. Yeah, it's between. It does. Did you know that? Yeah, it's between Kansas. Iran and uh, Russia. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan. It borders on Iran. Is it? So, a, you say Caspian Sea also. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. to the southeast of the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these Turanian people. Uh, who are more like, the, they are like Asiatic Turks. They are resemble today what we would call Turks, which are very cruel and sadistic people. Yeah. That's just well known. You know? And uh, what happened was that then there were the Semitic people, uh, which is to say the people of, uh, of the Fertile Crescent, you know, the people of Iraq, Syria, Libya, and so forth, the, the so-called Arabic Semitic peoples, and there were many different varieties of them, but they are like, generally speaking, uh, the Arab-speaking peoples, okay? Some of them were black, they didn't just have white skin. You know, they're, they're what are they, the Bedouin are Arabs, and they're black, right? Bedouins are black, right? So... That was the people in the main area of what is now like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, right? And the Tyrannians came down and they interbred with them. So they brought this nasty strain. It's very nasty. Isn't there a portal also there in this area? A portal? Yes. To space? That's what they say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. right. So they brought this nasty strain, genetic strain, into the Arabic peoples. <coughs> and when they interbred with the Arabic peoples, they produced this strain, which is the genetic identity of the Jews, and it's called the Arminoid. Arminoid? A-R-M-E-N-O-I-D. Arminoid. Yeah, the Arminoid. And I had never heard of this before, but this is a, presumably a, a, a specific genetic identity. In other words, you can test it genetically, and this is the genetic, genetic identity mm. of the Jews, according to this man that I just read recently. So this is just recent that I got this, like two weeks now, mm. and I'm like cooking this information. Mm. Okay. So the the knew this. Good question. Mm. Good question. You know, the Telestis had a. You know, they had their what's the word? You know, I've often wondered, and I'm sure you have as well. Uh, why were they were they prepared for the savage attack that came on them? You know, and I think that in certain ways the Telestai were, what's the word? They were a little too good-hearted, maybe. You know, you have to remember that they were educators, right? They were the educators of humanity, right? They created the mysteries, and they and they they created the universities they uh, of the ancient world. You know, uh, they taught literacy. They they invented alphabets and gave alphabets to the people. You know, when when you go back and to look into the history, say of the Middle East, uh, you know, you'll find that there is a term scholars use and and. Robert Graves also uses this term in the White Goddess. Secular alphabet. Secular alphabet. That is to say, it's an alphabet for the ordinary people. There were very ancient alphabets used by shamans and initiates that were completely unknown to the ordinary people. They were like secret codes. They were the... the they were the... Uh, Alcab alphabets of the elite of the shamans, mm. and uh, but then at a certain point 
the great teachers of humanity realized that humanity, the child, the Rome, was ready to learn. So just like you take a child in school and you teach it the alphabet, they taught the alphabet. But that was called the secular alphabet. They didn't teach the seeker alphabets. Okay? But they, they didn't want to um, teach about language first. Is that correct? Uh, they, they, they were li hesitate a little bit about uh, learning, uh, teaching about uh, intellectual... Yes, that's right. They waited mm -hmm. until the child, the Rome, mm -hmm. had a certain mm -hmm. level of maturity mm -hmm. before they would give it the alphabet. Because you can do a lot of bad things with the alphabet. There's a lot of disadvantages of the alphabet. You can see that today, maybe. Yeah, you know. It's a tool that you have to be able to use uh, skillfully. Yeah. They, they were so uh, perceptive yeah. about our, our nature, you know. Can you find this intellectual... Um, it's, a, it's a myth called the dragon's teeth. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. The dragon's teeth is a code word for the alphabet that was used by the initiates. Mm -hmm. It was called the dragon's teeth. Oh. Right? And it was a sound alphabet. It was like, it's like today you have Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And Sanskrit is very interesting because it's sort of on the border between a sacred alphabet and a secular alphabet. So you can find, for instance, that there are plays and uh, uh, plays, for instance, theatre plays that are written in Sanskrit language. So they're obviously for the public consumption. But there are other things that are written in Sanskrit language that are not for public consumption. You know, the, the mantras and the secret formulas, you know. Mm -hmm. So Sanskrit is very interesting because part of it is sacred and part of it is secular. Mm -hmm. You know, it has both sides. But the secular alphabets were taught by the initiates. Robert Graves says this in uh, The White Goddess. He mm -hmm. explains about this. You know? hmm. And the Gnostics introduced these alphabets and they taught people in the ancient world how to read and write. Hmm. They were the ones who did that. Somebody had to teach them how to read and write. Hmm. You know? It didn't just happen you know, automatically. Somebody said that uh, Sanskrit is, is uh, partly, exper partly experiential. It, uh, what's that word? Experiential. Uh, ex based on experience. So you cannot understand uh, certain uh, concepts without, without uh, ex direct experience of the concept. That's right. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I think. Right. That's very interesting. Right. Yeah. Like the, con the concept of Shabda. Shabda. Mm -hmm. You can explain what Shabda is, but the explanation won't really be very good because you actually have to experience Shabda and then you know what it is when you say Shabda. You know? And many things in Sanskrit are like that. Mm -hmm. There are technical words in Sanskrit that just, that there's no equivalent in any other language. It's an amazing language. Not that I know it, I can't read and write Sanskrit, but yeah. I know it. And well. what is Shabda? Shabda is the uh, sound <clears throat> of the, the sound that creates the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shabda. Mm -hmm. It's the sound mm -hmm. that is the basis of everything. Everything is sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Vibrations. Yeah, the way that the there's a term, a beautiful term in Sanskrit, the varnamala, and the varnamala means the necklace of flowers. Okay, um, mala is a necklace, like Osho. Mm. The people of Osho would have a mala. It's a necklace, but varna in Sanskrit means flower, but it also means letter like a letter of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. So this concept of the Varna Mala is very beautiful. So they say that uh, before the world was created, there was the goddess Shakti, the mm -hmm. 
the female divine part of the universe. And there was the god Shiva. And they were the male and female powers. But they were just existing in the god world and they had no created no material world. Okay? So what they say is that uh, the Shiva male was so thrilled by the beauty of his Shakti, you know, by his naked goddess woman, his naked yogini, you know, he was so thrilled by her beauty uh, that he gave her a gift. And this gift was a necklace. And it's called the Varnamala, which is a necklace of flowers. And it has 50 flowers on it. And so she put on the necklace that he gave her, and then she was so thrilled by the gift of this necklace <clears throat> that she began to radiate and to, to vibrate. And she vibrated the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet from the 50 flowers of her necklace. It was <laughs> so beautiful. This is an incredible story. <laughs> and then everything in creation was constructed out of those 50 vibrations of the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. Sounds like DNA or something. It's totally, <laughs> that is <laughs> totally <laughs> fucking <laughs> scientific. Took my thought. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it sounds like a fairy tale, but it isn't. It's no. totally scientific. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. There are 50 frequencies, mm -hmm. according to the Sanskrit, according to ancient mm -hmm. yogis, 50 frequencies. We work with 16 frequencies. So what we have done in planetary tantra today is that we don't, I don't use, I don't teach people any old systems. I only teach the future systems. Mm -hmm. The teachings that, the systems that I give are systems of the future. I don't teach any systems of the past. So the system of the future is 16 frequencies. And we have a model of this, mm -hmm. which we call the Shakti Cluster. It's a very beautiful mm -hmm. mandala of forces. This is my mm. 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 <laughs> well, Can you re repeat uh, what you suggested to, to say uh, to people like the extras uh, about when they attack you? No, when they ask. Uh, you, you mentioned yesterday. Mm. Uh, what we uh, have to start with, what we could um, tell as a beginning. To disseminate. What? To no. disseminate. The, the, the no, to, to uh, if uh, we shall explain about yeah. uh, what we are. Uh, oh, I remember. Uh, yeah. Yes. What were we talking about? Okay. Hmm. Right. Uh, you, Proposed, <laughs> are you word? That Did I propose something? Yeah, to. to uh, and you want me to remember what it was? <laughs> you are asking a lot. <laughs> you are demanding a lot. <laughs> For me to remember anything that I said last week. <laughs> it is on record. <laughs> yeah, it's on, it record, on record somewhere. Okay, yeah. it's I, on maybe record I will somewhere. transcribe it. Who knows? <laughs> you know, my attitude yeah, who knows? My attitude has always been like this. Uh, I have to be, I've ha I'm quite mellow now, you know. I'm pretty smooth now. Good. Because my tendency, uh, even till the time I got the turma, uh, was uh, to really fuck with people's minds. Anybody who is not paying attention, I would fuck with them really hard. You know? <laughs> I would give I have no Rude mercy. Language. <laughs> I have no mercy with them. <coughs> but I have and I that's my temperament because I am really uh, mm -hmm. I want to fight. I do. I'm Irish. Mm -hmm. And I would like to get into a fight all the time with somebody. Mm -hmm. Basically. Mm -hmm. You know? That's an Irish trait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However <laughs> 
over the course of time, <laughs> I realized that it wasn't productive no. for me to be that way. Mm. So I like, you know, as you say, tone it down, John, you know, tone it yeah. down, take it easy. So my, my view now is what we have to do uh, to live with the rest of the human race is to act more in a playful and flirtatious way mm -hmm. and to invite, you know, but, but underneath that you'll have a really serious, you know, intention. If you can get contact with someone and reach them, BAM! You're really going to reach them. Mm -hmm. But you, with a soft touch. Mm -hmm. You have to do it with a soft touch. I have done it with a very brutal touch. Yeah. I have been really brutal with people. And they have run away screaming, literally. Uh, you know. So now I'm like softer about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the strong intention. Mm -hmm. Then you have to like say, well, how can I play with them? How can I tease them? Mm -hmm towards something. But it also helps to know, in response to your question, uh, what it is that we, you know, where do we start? Where do we start, you know? Uh, it's a good question. Where do we start to bring them this message? Because it is so awesome. This message is so awesome. Oh, really? Fucking unbelievably beautiful. Huge. Everything is contained in it, yeah. you know. And where do you start, you know, to bring that to people? So I don't have a absolute answer for that. You know? We have to figure that out. Yeah, it will come. Yeah, it will come. If you build the morphogenetic field, they will come. Oh yeah. <laughs> if you build it, they will come. Yes. Field of dreams. Absolutely. The field of dreams is the morphogenetic field, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. Ru Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's not him. He uh, stole that. Oh. And it's uh -huh. very fucking dishonest. From, from where? He stole it from a Jew. He stole it from a Jew. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's really bad. <laughs> and the Jew... He's angry. And no, because he the Jew stole wonder. it from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> So that's okay then. <laughs> so I would say that the Jews stole it from probably a German. A German? Those evil Germans. <laughs> we hate those Germans. They are so wicked. <laughs> Named Alexander von Humboldt, who was a romantic uh, explorer and naturalist in the time of Goethe. Mm. Okay. So, Kessler, who was a Jew, stole the notion of morphogenetic fields from Humboldt or maybe even from Goethe himself. He stole it from the German Romantics. Mm -hmm. The German Romantics produced the notion of the morphogenetic field. Did they call it? Part of the, no, they had another name for it, which I can't tell you what it is right now. Mm. But in their brilliance, <laughs> and their observation of nature, they came up with this. Mm. And then Kessler, uh, around the 1950, stole it from them, mm -hmm. and then Sheldrake stole it from Kessler. Now, maybe I'm wrong. It might be possible that somewhere in his work, which I read years ago, Sheldrake, uh, you know, acknowledges, Sheldrake uh, uh, refers to Kessler. Mm. But I don't think so. I think he just stole it from Kessler and he pretended that he came up with it himself. Mm. And also he, he talks about uh, staring, at, staring at the back uh, experiments. Right? Yeah. 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 He's, he's done, and some, yeah, have done some intriguing some experiments. Yeah. And his talk on Ted was uh, retracted. Yeah. Too. Uh, it was called uh, Science Delusion about okay. how the natural science has failed. Completely lost ways. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good speech. I think I seen it. Uh, it's yeah. uh, some years right back. Yeah, four uh, or five, maybe because more. Because I think yeah, you send it to me, John. 
I liked it. Go on. So, yes. Do we talk yeah. about mitosis uh, before we leave, or should we do it tomorrow? We'll do it tomorrow. Okay. Good. It's a private uh, okay. discussion. Yeah? yeah. We'll do it tomorrow. All right. We three. Yes. Yes, we shall. Yeah. yeah. So I think that mm-hmm. is good for this evening. Mm-hmm. Have we recorded this? Yes. Oh, how wonderful. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah.